Now, the office. I've got to have a warehouse. I've got to have a plant to work out of. I was caught just right. All the, a lot of these old buildings that have been built by the church and others had reached the point where they're about ready to, to be uh, torn down and ready for something else. So I just get a hold of the Science Securities Leasing Department and I find a building. And this building is on Richard Street, is exactly one building from the center of this, uh, of this uh, 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 Temple Square, just down one building. And, on, and that building in front of it is Beneficial Life Insurance. And right down next to it was an old sign company. And there is embedded right in the sidewalk, S-I-G-N-S, -S, signs, vacant, ready to be rented. I take it. I think it's most appropriate. Then I find a place where I can build the signs, which today is right where the Symphony Hall is located. And that just kitty corner from Temple Square. And that was an old, old, beat up building that was long seen its day, but still they wanted to rent it. And I took it. So I got plenty of space to build the signs right within half a block from me, basically, to where my office is as the crow flies. And I look, standing on that, corner, that street, and I'm looking up at these other buildings, and I see a sign that says Phillips 66, and their logo on that. And then it says Division Headquarters. So I go there. It's up and about, oh, five stories up, six stories up. I think they took about four or five stories. And I walk in there. So I want to speak to the number one man over all of marketing. So they bring him in. His name is Taylor. I introduced myself and I said, well, is it possible you could give me a copy of all of your material that you have wherever there is uh, a, a, uh, an article, anything on your company, uh, materials that you send out to help introduce people to your products that you use for selling and promoting purposes and advertising. I want everything. I want to see what you're doing right now. Well, what do you want to see that for? Who are you? I said, well, I want to tell you something. My name is Doug Snarr from Snar Advertising. I am going to create an outdoor advertising campaign for you that will cover 10 states. And he broke out, his name was Dick Taylor. Dick Taylor broke out and he laughed. You are got to be joking. You're wasting your time. You're wasting the money. You'll never sell us in a million years. Our advertising is done by J. Walter Thompson in New York City. It's the biggest agency there at that time. And you, th they have that worked out for the next four to 10 years out on the, on, the, on the entire advertising. There is no way you can ever sell us. I said, Mr. Taylor, I'm not asking whether or not I can sell it. I buy you, because you don't even know who I am, you don't know what I can do. You don't have a clue. But what you've got out there is junk right now on the highways. It's just sheer junk. And I'm going to give you a campaign that is so superior to what J. Walter Thompson has done or probably will be able to do for you. I'm going to do that. All I want is the material. Now, I'm just right down here on Richard Street. I'm just right behind you, right down there. 
and you and I are going to be talking a lot, and you're going to get to see what I've done. So he handed to me, he's a young guy, but about, I'd say, 15 years older than me. Nice looking guy, a lot of energy, just a perfect marketing guy, just a lot of, you know, vinegar in him. And uh, so I took it. Now, I didn't build models like I did for Harris. Harris was a standalone models. This I did was on the face of hardboard. Uh, and uh, uh, I should say heavy, dense cardboard. And then I would take and build the sign on so it was in three dimensional. It's three dimensional, but didn't show the back of the sign and didn't show any of the back braces or anything like that. Just the front of the sign. But it was 3D. And it threw a little shadow, and it was very, very good. So I sat down and worked out, again, five signs. Now, I had to have the theme. Well, the smart thing to do is get what their latest theme is, because you're not going to change that. And that theme was, have fun going. That was their slogan. Phillips Petroleum Company. So we start the work, the laborious work, of creating these signs. Now, I uh, had hired a guy from, who graduated from BYU and then went to the Art Center. And uh, Keith Bagley was his name. I called him Bags. Uh, we ended up having a watercolor class at BYU. That's where I got to know him, Bags. Boise, Idaho. I'm from Idaho Falls, Idaho. And uh, worked out very nice because we could, we could uh, uh, battle it out between us. But he was doing more of the actual painting of it once we had the layout, I was more involved in the layout, the design of it, how the sign is to be designed, what, what's going to constitute the ad itself. And he would be the one that would implement that, which would give me up time. Because here I am down there, and I've got, and I'm selling other people at the same time. So, I mean, I mean I am, I'm trying to you know, make it work in this big city of Salt Lake City, and I don't know a soul except Charlie Taggart. Now, Charlie Taggart, you'll be surprised at the people he knew. So next thing, well, Doug, you ought to meet this guy. You got to meet this guy. And so he was arranging lunches for me. Now, isn't that wonderful? I, it's just wonderful. And everybody liked Charlie. So, uh, and here he was. And he was bragging about him. This guy here, what he's done. He built signs for Bill Harris. He's, he's from the Pacific to the... Mississippi, you can just hear Charlie right now, and these guys' eyes are big. Here I am sitting there, 25 years of age, and uh, here Charlie, I mean, I couldn't have anyone better in the whole world than him. And to think that he would do that. Boy, do I owe a lot to Charlie. Well, uh, I get it done. Now, Charlie is watching me do this. And he knows that I'm biting off something, that my, my odds are next to nothing. I didn't have a chance. He knew that. But as these signs developed, he changed. He said, that's better than anything on these highways out here, Doug. You already got something. You got something. So when I get it all done, he says, you know, Doug, there's one person you got to meet. His name is Henry D. Moyle, Jr. Hank Moyle, who is the son of Henry D. Moyle of the first presidency of this church. And Henry D. Moyle was aggressive, a strong personality and very rich. Now, Henry D. Moyle and two of his brothers had started an oil company early in their uh, business career. 
Henry D. was the attorney and the negotiator for the other two brothers. And one was kind of an engineer and so on. And they built up a refinery in North Salt Lake. And later on, they sold out and they swapped for stock as well as cash to Phillips Petroleum Company. Henry D. Moyle, because of who he was and how respected he was, at their annual meeting, stockholders meeting, he would introduce, it was a tradition, Boots Adams, and Boots Adams was the chairman of the board and the CEO of Phillips Petroleum Company. And he ran a tight ship and he was a powerful man. And he had been there right with the very beginning uh, as a very, very young man when the, the company was first formed and started with the uh, older, more experienced man and Boots Adams uh, followed him. So there was this relationship. So he said, Doug, I'm going to bring Hank Moyle over. And let him see what you've done here. So he brings Hank over. I get to meet Hank Moyle. Thanks to Charlie. All are needed by each one. Nothing is fair or good alone. Alone you're nothing, boy. You gotta have influence. And you get that through the right contacts. And Charlie was a gold mine for me. And he enjoyed doing it because he knew I could deliver. Well, Hank sees him. He says, gee, Doug, my dad's got to see this. You, Doug, how are you going to sell this? I says, I don't have a clue. All I know is that I, I've always done it by, by risking. I am willing to risk a lot of money up front to get a big sale. That's how I make it work. He says, I'm going to go and tell my dad about this. So we had, we had a couple of lunches, by the way, and he drilled me with questions and how old I was and all about my family and everything else. And we, we got together. We even got our two families together and uh, uh, Hank and his wife and his kids, bango, goes and sees his dad. And his father said, Hank, tell me, how good are these signs? He said, Dad, there's never been a sign made by Phillips Petroleum Company that's as good as what I've seen. They're the best that the, sign, the company's ever had. So what the father did was this. He wrote a letter to Kenneth Rue, number one man over all of advertising of Phillips Petroleum Company. And it's a one-page letter. Now, I've never seen that letter. I've only had Hank tell me what it said. He said, one of my friends has designed an outdoor advertising campaign for Phillips. It is the best that Phillips has ever had. He wants to meet with you. Uh, he will call you because I'm giving him your number. Would you please write me back and tell me what you think of his presentation? <laughs> Talk about knocking a home run, you know. Now, so yeah, I was told to wait, you know, for a few days. 
Because I think he says he'll be calling you uh, shortly. Tell me, you know, what you feel about, think about his presentation. So, a few, uh, about a week later, I phoned the number. Now, I don't get to Ken Rue. He gets, puts me down here to the, to a man named Ollie Bettis. And I'm told by Ken Rue's secretary, call Ollie. So I make a second phone call. And Ollie, as you can tell, he is that southern drawl. I will give you 15 minutes and 15 minutes only. And as the time was given, and I had these big, these big cardboard signs, and I had this big space, and kind of get them down there and everything else, and Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Where's Bartlesville? Well, I had a friend who had a friend <laughs> who lived in our stake up here on the mountain, Mount Olympus. He had his own airplane. He loved to fly. So I call him. How much for a day? You fly me down to Bartlesville. I give my presentation. It's only going to be 15 minutes. And you fly me back. I'd love to do that. Oh, that would be one of the most fun things I've done in a long while. I'll do it. As long as I charge you it is the petroleum cost. That's all. It's just a pleasure to fly you down. So I get down there. I get in that room with Ollie Bettis, an older man. Now I said to myself, I got 15 minutes. I don't have any time for any introduction. They know something already about me because of the letter from Henry D. Moyle. And if he introduces Boots Adams at every stockholder meeting, and has done for many years, and integrated his company into Phillips Petroleum Company, they know that I'm not some guy off the street. Therefore, I got to focus on one thing only, just show the science. It's not like with Harris Club, where I could explain to them the philosophy of outdoor advertising. None of that business. Just lay it on the line. And so I did. One after another, five of them. Got all done. He said, Mr. Schnarr, we've given you 15 minutes. Uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think Ken Rue's got to see this. This surprises me. I, I must tell you that I wasn't expecting anything like this. So now he phones Ken Rue. So Ken Rue comes down into the meeting. Now by the time that takes place, I've been there for at least a half hour. Now Ken Rue came in, kind of dressed the way I am right now, with a tweed coat. Natty dressed. You could tell he was a Harvard MBA and the business. Very, very serious and very abrupt and very much uh, in control and uh, demanding, but nice and polite. He sees the signs. He said, Mr. Snarr, would you have lunch with uh, Ollie and me? I said, oh, sure, sure. He says, I want to know all about you. This is better than anything we've ever had at Phillips, right here. And we try and get this advertising agency to use a little imagination and they just don't have it when it comes to outdoor advertising. I like what you've got here. 
I'll be honest with you. So we had lunch. Well, I got my pilot out there. Couldn't get back. So now I'm worried about my pilot. And I don't know what to do. And uh, finally I said, well, I got this pilot. And, uh, and I rented a, a, you know, a flight down the back. Invite him to lunch. Bring him along. So he joined us. And that made me feel good, so the pilot could feel like, you know, his time wasn't wasted, that maybe some good might come from it, though I didn't really have a chance to start off with. Well, that day goes on to, I'd say, at least about, about 2, 2.30, something like that. And the bottom line was this. We want to set up a meeting in your office in Salt Lake City, we want to have our division uh, people there in charge of advertising, and we will be there. Ollie and I will be there. We want it at 9 o'clock, and he gave me the date. Well, I had this big apart, this big office complex, and I had the desk here for me. Two drawing boards, one for Keith Bagley and one for me. And I think I had a desk for a couple of other guys that were helping, working. That was it. Now, I had this plant to build, which was owned by the church, running from them. It was less than a block away. I said, I got to figure out how to, he's got to know that we're just not some scruds here. So I work it out with Kelly Company to rent four desks. Then I want to have four girls hired. I want four typewriters. I got to have the chairs. I got to make this look like there's at least something going on here. And I remembered I went and got a big, big bowl. We got to have fruit in here, nice fresh fruit. And just napkins and they can take and have a little bit, a little bit of a plate and so on. And uh, it's early in the morning. You might want to have a little something. And then, the night before, I said, Bags, what we got is not good enough. We got to do one more sign. Doug, you're nuts. Doug, they're coming here because of what you've already done. You don't want to get them thinking about all this other stuff. Focus on what they've done, because they'll make a decision based upon what you've got. I said, Bags, we're going to do one more sign. Doug, that'll take all night. I know it. And I'll be here right with you all night. And we're going to do it. One more sign sign. So there'll be six signs. So we're going to let them know we're flexible. Bags the flexibility of your adaptability is the true measure of your intelligence. Now, one more sign. One more sign. So we worked out the sketch and, uh, and I sat there with Bags and encouraged him. I said, now you can implement this. I've, I've done the, I got the idea for you. I've sketched out the sign for you. Now you implement it. And he did. We finished at 15 to 5. Well, I'm got to, we got to go home. I'll be back there by 9 o'clock. Sooner than that, because we got to get these girls organized so I told them to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. 
and get these desks and everything organized. Of course, the desks came in the, the day before, by the way. So this looks like all this busyness going on, see. And so they came in on time. And they had the, Dick Taylor was there. He was in a state, he was staggered by the fact that not only did they not uh, show interest, they flew clear to Salt Lake City to check me out and to see what the situation was. And I said, well, I'm going to exaggerate about the office, but my working plant, that's my business, so what? It's not fancy or flashy, but I've got enough space there I can build the signs. Make a long story short, they bought 150 signs. In the day's market, that would be between 10 to 12 million dollars. I got a four-year contract. They pay me that money over a four-year period. I own the signs. <laughs> So that gives me an opportunity to renew. I did renew those signs for another four years. I made a lot of money on Phillips Petroleum Company. They bought one sign. From those six signs, it was the last sign. The only one they bought was that last sign. That was a miracle. I've had two miracles in the business world. One was Harris Club, where they came to me. One was Phillips, where Charlie, Charlie Taggart, helped to organize for me a friend, Hank Moyle, Jr., right into the first presidency, a letter. And from that, I made the sale. Like they say in the business world, the sale is never made. And in my case, you make the sale, but you got a second sale to make. Because where are you going to get the money, Doug, to build the signs? So I needed a, at least, in today's money, a loan for five million dollars. And I'm sitting in Salt Lake City that works to my disadvantage. So going up into the Bank of Idaho and asking them to finance this, they've already financed one, Harris, for seven and a half million in today's money. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go back and Bank of Idaho and say, hey, I got me another contract. This time it's Phillips Petroleum Company. You're not going to have to have a special uh, agreement that in the event of a collapse of the company that uh, Mr. Hara, in the case of the Harris Club, will personally guarantee it. You don't need any personal guarantees. I've got that with Phillips Petroleum Company. Well, I went back, went through my little pitch. He said, well, Doug, we've loaned you seven and a half million. That's a lot of money. You're going to have to get a second bank to finance the Phillips Petroleum Company, the billboards that they bought from you. Well, where do I go? I don't know anybody in the banking world in Salt Lake City. And so what I thought what I would do is go to the biggest bank in the state of Idaho, 
which is the Idaho First National Bank, and see them. Now, you always need an introduction. In the case of the Bank of Idaho, the introduction was the bank in Idaho Falls, the Bank of Com or in Rexburg in, in those days, the Bank of Commerce. That was an introduction. Just have them call me, which they did do, by the way. And uh, the president of that bank spoke very highly of me and was very encouraging. And the Bank of Idaho was bought off. I've already told you the story. Now, this Idaho First National Bank is a whole different breed. We don't have a James Byers. We have a whole different, more of a bureaucratic organization. But I got to the number two man named Tom Fry. Never smiled. Just kind of just looked at you. Showed him the contract. And they said yes. But we had to give them a lot of information. A lot of information. They wanted confirmation all down the line. I didn't have that with the Bank of Idaho. They just knew that I had no really experience. They just went with me. And one thing I'd like to mention at this point that I haven't mentioned before. My brother, just younger than me, uh, Jim, uh, Merlin James Snar was his full name, named after my father, Merlin. But Jim, I approached, he really has a lot of personality. I've already mentioned that to you. And if he would be willing to get the locations, and I made it very, very rich for him, a very good deal to get the locations. Now, he got the locations for the Harris Club. I want to give him credit for that. And what he did was a remarkable job. Jim just had a lot of personality and he was smart. Very smart indeed. Now on uh, Phillips, he agreed to get the locations. And he got every single one. So I'm giving him credit to find those locations. And I do not know where I could have gone and found someone of the quality and ability to get those locations like Jim. We got those signs built. I got the money. Now, one of my, I always try on a, when I have time on a presentation, to somehow integrate a, a saying or something like that into it and uh, to help somehow to give me and uh, to, uh, where I can present myself in a context of not just a plain businessman that doesn't know anything beyond the subject matter at hand. So I found it important to be able to have a quotation of some kind to leave. And uh, since we're talking about a sign approach, and my signs are vertical, and everyone else's is horizontal, I quoted Emerson. I've referenced this to you before, but I made that part when Ken Rue came to meet with me this was my quotation from what Ralph Waldo Emerson. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. 
And so from that I said, the foolish consistency is making all signs the same manner, and that is a, a horizontal rectangle. This is not, this is free form. This is designed just for you. You'll ha have no one else on the highways will have your shape of that sign. And it's going to draw attention. And I'd rather sell a teenager or a young person than I would an older person. So if I can appeal, appeal to a younger person with a little cartoon and do it just right, then I establish a cell that could go on and on and on. The likelihood increases immensely rather than a 70-year-old, 60-year-old person. I'd rather sell a kid. So let's have some fun with these signs. Let's have a little humor, and let's have fun going, which was the slogan. They bought off on that. A foolish consistency, a foolish tradition is the hobgoblin of little minds. We're not that. We're new and big thinkers. And that extra sign an extra piece of artwork proved that I myself wasn't bound to tradition. We've only we've got five already. That's all we need. No, we're going to give them one more to look at, so they know that I want this sale. And with that letter that goes back to the first presidency of this church will be positive. I wanted that. And Henry D. Moyle got a very positive letter from Mr. Ken Rue. That I know through Hank Moyle. Now where do we go? I'm kind of doing pretty good. My name is being battered around a little bit in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is a hard city. It's a difficult city because there's so much talent. And the reason there's so much talent is because of all these return missionaries. Because the mission is really the, uni the Lord's university. And they learn things, and I learn things from the mission of how to approach people, how to knock on a door, how to get through the door how to make the most of it. They gain a confidence that they can get no other way. They can't get that out of a book. I don't care how many books, they can't get that out of getting 101 degrees. It only is just the experience. And one thing that most missions and missionaries experience is the word no. So how do you deal with no? You can't let it beat you. So you've got to keep on pushing forward. 